If you were to try to name a single city that has had perhaps the greatest impact on the history of our world, it would be difficult to say for sure which one it is. But one city that should surely be considered among many is Rome. How did the city begin? How did it become the biggest and most powerful city in the ancient world? How did it fare through the Middle Ages? And how is it still relevant today? According to ancient Roman legend, the Latin-speaking tribes of Latium, now Italy's Lazio region, were believed to have descended from refugees from Troy, likely in the 11th century BC, made up of a small group of survivors in the Trojan War, led by Prince Aeneas. They settled the central part of Italy's Tyrrhenian Sea coast, and created numerous city-states and worshipped Greek gods with Latin names. No, it wasn't theft if they were the same gods to begin with. In the 8th century BC, Former princess turned vessel virgin Rhea Silvia was raped by Mars and gave birth to the twins Romulus and Remus. In order not to cause a significant challenge to the throne of Alba Longa, the two were put out into the Tiber River and later found ashore by a wolf who nursed them back to health. They were later raised by farmers and protected local villagers from bandits and thus became quite popular. Eventually, they went out to found their own city, but they couldn't agree which hill to found it on, so Romulus eventually killed Remus and Rome emerged about a day later. Unlike most other Latin city-states, however, they welcomed outcasts into their society as well to build a population. However, some of the details of Rome's founding are pretty complicated and also pretty f***ed up, so I'm just going to leave it there. Rome started out as a kingdom, really a city-state, and had seven kings, from Romulus to Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, or Tarquin the Proud. By the way, I'm going to try to pronounce these names the way they would have been pronounced in Roman Latin. So if it sounds weird, that's why. The kings established the framework of what Rome was to be, establishing things like calendars and sewer systems. However, the one problem was that the seventh king, Tarquin, basically sucked. So he was deposed, and Rome vowed to never give, give one man, and yes, it was generally men, sole power over the country. In 509 BC, the Roman Republic was established, a democratic society led by the Senate with two consuls elected once a year. These senators came from the patrician class, which is really a certain class of families that were allowed to hold political office. Everyone else were the plebeians, even if they were as rich as patrician families. This angered quite a few people until the rules were relaxed and the plebs were allowed into politics. Fast forward and it's the year 264 BC, when Rome decides to take part in the newest trend, So You Think You Can Mediterranean. This was the start of the First Punic War, where Rome wanted Sicily, but Carthage, based in modern-day Tunisia, as well as some Greek colonies, already occupied it. But then some fighting happened, and by the end of the war, in 246 BC, Rome now owns Sicily. By the way, I should mention that since Rome and Carthage were quickly becoming the two superpowers in the Mediterranean, these three wars were probably the most important in Roman, and likely by extension, Western history. Anyway, in 218 BC, the Second Punic War started. Hannibal, son of the successful general Hamilcar Barca, who made him to court oath to never be a friend of Rome, waged war against Rome while he was in his 20s. Not exactly a friendly thing to do. Hannibal's most famous accomplishment came when, in 218 BC, he marched an army of elephants from Hispania across the Alps and into Italia, where he terrorized the Italian countryside. The reason he did this, though, wasn't because it was strategic. In fact, most of his army perished in the mountains. It was because Rome now controlled the waterways, which would have made a sea invasion impossible, since Rome also had much better ships. However, by 201 BC, the war was starting to go so badly for Carthage that they were forced to abandon Hispania. The Third Punic War went from 149 to 146 BC, which was essentially the Siege of Carthage, largely brought on by former Roman consul Marcus Porcius Cato, or Cato the Elder, who, in his term in 195 BC, ended all his speeches with the line, and I also think Carthage must be destroyed. Imagine what a speech this would have been like. Res praetera in Hispania agricolas de primeric oporet nos super tributa. Et ceterum caseo carterminum esse direnda. Can't imagine if politicians did this today. Anyway, the siege of Carthage ended in 146 BC, when, under the leadership of a young Tiberius Gracchus, Rome captured a city, selling the citizens that didn't kill into slavery, and pouring salt into the ground so nothing could grow on its former grounds, and destroying the city to such an extent that we today can't find it on the map. It was somewhere around modern day Tunis, but we're not completely sure. After this, the successful general Tiberius Gracchus, who was now fighting for farmers' rights, became very unpopular in the Senate, to the point where they actually accused him of trying to become king. And in the Roman Republic, there was no greater sin, so they stabbed him and threw him into the Tiber. A little less than a hundred years later, though, another successful general, 
this time responsible for conquering Gallia, will be accused of much of the same thing. His name? Julius Caesar. You see, the Republic had a system in place where, in a time of crisis, a general or a consul could be temporarily promoted to the title of dictator, and by 45 BC, a Yacta Adea Est, and Caesar was granted this title for life, because of his popularity. But 23 steps later, and the senators have proven how they felt about this. But shocker, people felt pretty differently. And after 17 more years, insert civil war here, and Octavian, Caesar's adopted son, changed his name to Augustus Caesar, and became the first emperor of the Roman Empire. They changed the name to Imperator so that he wouldn't be a king. To many, Rome's success stories kind of start here, despite the 700 years of previous history and the fact that we're 7 minutes into the video. Rome was under the control of the Kaiser dynasty, which inspired many later empires and their leaders to call themselves something similar, from Kaiserly Rome in the early Ottoman Empire, to the Kaiser of Germany, to being pronounced more like the word seizure in French and English, to a salad dressing in Tijuana. After Augustus, there was Tiberius, who was paranoid of assassination and spent most of his rule secluded in the Capri, then came crazy Caligula, and then Claudius, with his stutter, his limp, and his successful conquest of Britain. And then the dynasty ended with Nero, who, despite being crazy, didn't actually play the fiddle while Rome burned in 64 AD. After Nero committed suicide in 68 AD, Galba took the throne, and then Otto, then Vitellius, and then Vespasian, commencing the Flavian dynasty. Around this time, the Jews rebelled, the Sacred Temple was destroyed, and the goods plundered from the temple went to fund construction of the Flavian Amphitheater, or the Colosseum, opened by Vespasian's son, Titus Flavius, in the year 80. Now, as Rome expanded it, it did so while also making newly conquered provinces Roman, not just property of the government operated in the city of Rome. But everyone living in outer provinces, at least those who weren't slaves, were full Roman citizens. They even did this with their pantheon of gods, where they would bring some gods from conquered tribes into their religion. For one example, in Britain, the Romans didn't want to give up their goddess Minerva, while the native Celts also didn't want to give up their goddess Sulis. So they combined the two into Sulis Minerva. After the once prosperous city of Pompeii was destroyed in the year 79 and basically just forgotten about, the Flavian dynasty continued with Domitian, Minerva, and then Thrian, the first emperor born outside of Italia who oversaw the empire's largest territorial expanse in the year 117, and swiftly followed by while building Hadrian, Antoninus Pius, Lucius Veros, philosopher emperor Marcus Aurelius, and ending with Commodus. By 180 AD, however, came the end of Pax Romana, a two-century period in Roman history that was actually pretty peaceful, both inside and just outside the empire. In 293, noticing the empire's size, Duke Letian proclaimed a new system for governing the empire, known as the Tetrarchy, at least to us today. This plan involved splitting the empire into two halves, each ruled by a senior Augustus and a junior Caesar, so two halves, each with two emperors. However, by the year 324 AD, Constantinus, or Constantine I, went out to reassemble the empire under his control, and declared that Christianity would be tolerated in the Roman Empire. He died in 337 AD, converting to Christianity on his deathbed. Theodosius I, dying in the year 395, and the same year Christianity was made the state religion, would be the last emperor to rule over both halves of the Roman Empire. The 5th century, however, would turn out quite badly for the Western Roman Empire, and a bit of a bother to the Eastern Roman Empire, especially as Rome became a shadow of its former self, and the imperial capital was even moved to Rowena. Over the century, the empire gave up province after province to various Germanic tribes, and in 476, Romulus Augustus, the last Western Roman Emperor, was deposed by Odoacer, who briefly established a kingdom in Italy, until the Eastern Roman Empire, under Justinian I, reclaimed it by the Eastern Roman Empire's territorial height in 555. In the 8th century, though, as we begin to split our history off from the rest of the old empire, since they didn't have Rome in it, the century began with church arguments and ended with a brief Lombard invasion in 772, which was ended by Charlemagne a year later. On Christmas 800, the Pope went up to Charlemagne and decided, surprise, you're the new emperor of Rome, to which Charlemagne might have said, dude, knock first. Well, probably not, they were in St. Peter's Basilica, so it might not have been that much of a surprise. But Charlemagne was the first Western Roman Emperor in over 300 years, so people thought this was a big thing, even though this wasn't really, it was more of a symbolic thing. One thing that also happened a little bit earlier was that a new state was established, simply known as the Papal States, established in 754 AD, so close to being symmetrical. 
During this time, Italy was split into multiple tiny city-states, which besides the Papal States also included the Kingdom of Venice, as well as the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, as well as Genoa, as well as Florence, as well as Canada. The Papal States, essentially the direct precursor to Vatican City, was more powerful than it may have looked on a map, since the Pope basically controlled everything as long as you were Catholic. Things were somewhat stable in Lazio for the next thousand years or so, though Italy was still too divided to contribute to the first rounds of colonialism. At the turn of the 19th century, Rome was briefly captured by Napoleon, but that didn't last long. However, in the 1860s and 70s, a new threat came upon the horizon. Sniff sniff, do you smell that? It's fascism! Well, not at first, but we'll get to that. Actually, it was the very non-fascist kingdom of Italy, who in 1870 decided that Rome would make a way better capital than Turin, so they took it. The Pope hid behind the walls of the Vatican until 1929, when they finally struck a deal with the actually fascist Benito Mussolini to let them be independent, though hilariously tiny. Italy established some colonies in Libya, Somalia, and Ethiopia, but by 1914, World War I came along, and Italy initially joined the Triple Alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary, but not the Central Powers, necessarily. In 1915, however, they were brought into secret meetings with representatives from the Allied and Central Powers, the Allies offering them territory for joining them, and the Central Powers offering them same for just being neutral. Italy chose the other option to neutrality, much like we did last winter. After the war, they were also given a permanent seat in the League of Nations. In 1929, the same year as the previous agreement with the Pope, there was a huge crash on Wall Street. No, like an economic crash. And the whole world basically blew up. All of a sudden, everyone was doing absolutely poorly, and people were going off to form new political ideas, leading to ideas ranging from socialism to fascism. Germany and Italy went with fascism, which went rather poorly for them by 1945. After the war, King Victor Emmanuel III abdicated and proclaimed his son Umberto as his successor in May 1946. But a month later, Republicans won in a popular referendum, and the Kingdom of Italy became the current Italian Republic. Italy became a founding member of the European Union, and a member of NATO, and held some US missiles. And Rome hosted the 1960 Summer Olympics, and the 1990 FIFA World Cup. After the opening of Leonardo da Vinci Fiumicino Airport in 1961, Tourism took off, and Rome now attracts 7 to 10 million tourists every year, while having a population of about 4 million, being the third most visited city in the European Union. Plus, they have a sovereign nation within their city limits. Not too bad for such a city. Thanks for watching this summary of the history of Rome, or the history of Italy in a sense. I apologize if I missed something massive, but to be fair, it's Rome we're talking about here, and I didn't want this to be a 3 hour long documentary. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, share it, and subscribe to learn something new every Sunday.